Good evening, and welcome to the Fruit of Child Training live webinar. I'm Nathan Pearl. Here with me, I have my dad, my mom, and my two younger sisters, Shalom and Shoshana. Missing tonight is my older brother and sister, and they are unfortunately both out of town. The purpose of this broadcast tonight is we want to encourage the families across America that there is light at the end of the tunnel, that there is a goal worth attaining. We want you to know that if you, if you train your children, and if you love your spouse, and if you obey the Word of God, that one day you'll look back and say, truly, I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in truth. Before we get started with that, we have to address some of the, the firestorm that's been going in the media for about the last year. There was a, a young girl in California whose parents apparently uh, beat to death. There was uh, another young girl in uh, Washington State whose parents uh, denied food uh, as a form of punishment until she came to the elements and she died. Apparently in one of the houses, there was one of dad's books called To Train Up a Child found amongst a, a multitude of other literature. And uh, in uh, the other home, one of the neighbors said that they thought at one time they may have had this book, but they never found it. And so the media took this and, and they ran with it. And they, they made all kinds of, of claims that these people beat their children to death or starved their children to death because of something that was written in one of dad's books. And so uh, they came to us and we thought, well, we'll straighten this out. And we said, well, have you read the book? And they, they stopped and looked somewhat stunned and said, well, no, I don't need to. I already know what's in it. And, and we said, well, that's, that's ludicrous. That's insane. How, how can you stand up in front of the nation and make a claim and not have checked it out, not looked at it at all? And um, they said, we'll just stand by our guns. You're, you're this, and we have no interest in what you say or what you actually wrote. We know that this is what you are. And that is uh, hurtful. It's, it's uh, a little bit odd. We, we hate to be the butt of their joke, their, their agenda, simply to give them ratings. But uh, that's not the worst part as, as far as it affected us. The worst part is that believers started to believe the redundant message that they were giving over and over again, these little five-minute bites that this is what, and, and we said, no, it's not. It's, it's not what we teach at all. It's not even close. And they said, well, yes, it is. And, and people believe the media, some people. And so we want to address that tonight. We want to, to speak directly to you without being filtered by the producer that hates God, that, that hates Christians, and uh, we want to, to answer some of the questions that have come at us. The reason we want to do it is not for self-vindication. It's not for a, uh, a chance to, uh, to say we're right and they're wrong. The reason we want to do it is for the little boys and girls across America that will be hurt, that will be lost, that will miss out on the wonderful childhood that me and my siblings had, because they believe something that a lost, angry man produced in order to make ratings. We just, we think that's awful. So I want to ask some of the questions that the media ask, and I want to give Dad a chance to address some of these things. And um, as, we, as we go through the night, uh, we're going to be referencing some of the material that, that Mom or Dad has written uh, just as it comes up. And so for tonight, for those of you that are joining us live, we have a, uh, a coupon code that uh, we'll put up periodically, and you can use that for big discounts on uh, things in the bookstore and uh, in the, the CDs and things like that. If there's something that we reference that you don't have or that you want to get for somebody else, uh, make use of these coupon codes just for tonight, and it will uh, save you some money. Okay, Dad... Um, on, on the news, we, we saw you talking to Anderson Cooper and Dr. Drew and others, and um, they would fly you to New York or California or wherever they flew you to, and, and you'd be gone, and you, we knew you were, oh, Dad's on the news for an hour and a half, and they'd show a three-minute clip. And uh, 
for two and two minutes and 50 seconds, you weren't talking out of the three minute clip. What was it like being in the studio, being with these guys? Uh, of course, you don't get to actually meet Anderson Cooper. Uh, he comes into the dressing room and he's there 30 seconds to say hi and then he's gone. And then the next time you see him, you're walking out in front of 100 people that are gassed and uh, sitting down in front of a bunch of bright lights and a whole lot of cameras and, and uh, they're shooting questions at you lickety split and you're trying to answer them and they've got uh, four or five other people there that are with a different opinion that are contributing their part and it all seems to be over just by the time it started. So uh, it's, uh, it's very, uh, very fast paced. It's entertainment and the people are there to be entertained. And so that's what the media is interested in. They have a profile that they uh, invented a long time before Mike Pearl ever came along. And that profile uh, is sort of an Elmer, Elmer Gantry type thing. It's uh, anti-Christian, anti-family, anti-conservative. And so they're looking for someone to, to build their straw man around, someone to fulfill their, their uh, TV image of what a evil Christian parent is supposed to be like, what a conservative pastor is supposed to be like. And so if you don't uh, fill that profile, they will, uh, they're not uh, above being dishonest about representing you. And there's been a lot of dishonesty coming out of the entertainment media. What are some of the, the, the things that didn't get covered that uh, should have? What, I mean, because they really, they really were censoring you, uh, the, the stuff that, that we saw. What are some of the things that they cut out or that they censored out that they kept the message from being on point? Okay, when you go into one of those entertainment programs like that, you have to sign a document that says you will not disclose anything that, that took place there in it. So I'm legally bound not to, to tell if something was, was deleted or left out or if something was altered or changed. Uh, they do that, obviously, because they don't want to be second-guessed at another time. So I really can't uh, say all I can do is, is answer questions directly about what I believe or what I, what I practice. I can't actually say what took place when I was on set. I did not know that they did that. <laughs> they sure do. Where, where do I get some of those documents? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, then, then I'll ask a direct question. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I heard asked was you, the, the, the big thing that they grabbed a hold of. I mean, you have volumes of material. Uh, you have a lot of things that you wrote about. The big thing that they grabbed a hold of was that you advocate training and to some degree discipline a, a six-month-old all the way up to adulthood. Well, the media repeatedly quotes things they got off the web that are lies and they quote it as if it were something I actually said. There are actually many quotes in the, uh, on the web and uh, by many of the media personality where they're quoting me, but I never said that. Uh, you'll actually read uh, where they quote my book and it's not actually in my book. Uh, these things are just invented and they have, a, they have an evolving life of their own on the web and in the media as one person quotes them, another person quotes them and they change the meaning. In fact, uh, I very seldom, out of a uh, hundred quotes, I may find one or two that are accurate. Uh, some of them are total, complete fabrication. So uh, one of the things that disturbs uh, them a lot is uh, saying that I teach that you are to hit small children. <laughs> in fact, I teach you're never to hit children at all, never in any case are you to hit children, especially a big old hand like that, I wouldn't hit a child. Now we teach child training. Child training is not child spanking. Child, it's not child discipline, it's child training. And you train children from day one. You train them, a mother trains her children when she's nursing them. Uh, Shoshana back here trained, uh, potty trained her uh, little girl. Uh, by the time she was two weeks old, she would go on the pot. Now that doesn't mean she doesn't mess up occasionally, but uh, she was trained to know what a toilet was and, and to go on the toilet. And so she didn't do that by spanking the little girl. She did that by uh, repeat performance, taking the child and uh, instilling in her a, a knowledge of what she desires. So it's sort of a, a stimulus process of teaching. So we teach training children 
uh, from age, uh, from the day they're born. Now, a six-month-old child, we don't uh, spank a six-month-old child. You, you, you couldn't spank a child until they got old enough to understand what they did wrong and uh, feel guilt for it, to be ashamed of it, uh, or to be uh, rebellious and throw a little fit. Uh, when they get old enough and mature enough, then you'd spank them. But we do use physical stimuli. For instance, uh, if a child reaches out and grabs your beard, uh, three months old, then you pull his fingers loose by force and say, no, don't pull my beard. If he grabs it again, you might thump his hand like this so that he pulls his hand away and say, no, don't pull my beard. So about two or three occasions like that, and uh, they're, they're calling that hitting, you know. All we're doing is thumping the hand away so the child removes his hand and we're saying no. We're communicating to the child what we mean by no. And uh, that's the way you learn not to pull my beard. And, uh, and Shoshana too, and Shalom. Uh, and uh, we're, uh, we're instilling discipline. But the child's not hurting, they're not crying, we're not beating them, we're not hitting them with thump like that. And uh, as they get a little older, uh, six or seven months old, and you tell a child not to climb stairs, and they climb stairs, you might take a, a little switch and, and spank them at the point they climb the stairs. In other words, hit them on the hand or hit them on the, when you catch them trying to go up the stairs. But you don't, you don't sit them down or lean them over a bed and give them a whipping, a punishment, uh, anything like that. You use the rod as a stimulus in training and communicating no. But it's uh, never to the point to leave a mark or even cause them to scream and holler. A child needs to be two, three years old before you start really uh, giving them spankings. And if you're properly training, the spanking won't have to happen. But once every two, three weeks or once a month or once every three months. The idea of spanking a child in submission is not something I've taught. That's something the media wants us to teach. And so they try to communicate that idea that we're going around with a rod trying to train our kids beating on them all the time. Nothing in our material says that. That's total fabrication by the media. Okay, Shalom. Uh, you are, I think all of us would agree, the, the gentlest, the, 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 probably the sweetest <laughs> of all, all five of us kids. Much more than her. Much, much <laughs> more than Shauna. Um, <laughs> but, but you really are. You really are more gentle and, 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 and more caring about uh, about hurting people's feelings, about your own feelings, about stuff than the rest of us. How do you feel like this type of training affected you? How, how, how was your experience growing up? Um, I have to say I love this question because, for one, I love the concept and idea of training. Because I'm a gentle spirit, like you said, I don't like spanking. And so my approach and the way mom and dad trained me was to direct me and guide me before I ever needed a spanking. Because I'm a gentle spirit, kind of, I don't need it. I didn't need it. So I remember dad said, uh, sp uh, climbing up steps. I actually remember this, not from just your stories, <laughs> but when I was just a baby, I was crawling, what, seven months old? And we had a really steep staircase in the living room. And I don't remember, did it have railings? Yeah. It had railings. but as their baby they didn't want me falling and so they didn't want me to climb the steps and I remember crawling around on the floor and coming to the steps and going up two or three steps and mom telling me no smacking my hand and pulling me off the steps I remember sitting at the bottom of the steps wanting to climb it going back into the kitchen climbing back to the steps and mom knowing that I don't really I didn't need a spanking I just needed to remember and have direction not to do it. She laid the spanking stick on the bottom of the steps. The oh, stick. you, sorry. Don't take his I'm good the, idea. <laughs> I'm the one that <laughs> thought of it. I was saving you. I don't you remember. I don't remember who did it. I just remember. I, as a baby, I climbed to the steps and I remember looking at that spanking stick and looking at them in the kitchen and looking back at the spanking stick and looking at them in the kitchen and I remember coming, going, like crawling back under the table, 
into the kitchen and thinking about it and going back to the spanking stick again. And I never climbed the steps again and I never fell. And so they, in them directing me and guiding me, they saved me from falling down the steps and might have, you know, hurting myself. And so, you know, they could have put up a railing and kept me from doing it. But if we had gone to somebody else's house and they had had steps and I was a climber, I could have climbed, you know, somebody else's steps and could have gotten hurt. Um, I, so. I actually remember the switch, and I, I got in trouble one time because Gabe and I took the switch to sword fight with. <laughs> <laughs> and she tried climbing the stairs. <laughs> I think I got the switch. I don't remember that part. <laughs> I do. I remember it. It was going up to your studio. Up at the, yeah, it worked so well. When she's 14, we had to teach her to climb stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure there were no cane around. Um, so it, it, I, I have seen you. Uh, I don't remember the occasion, but we were down at the creek, and uh, there was a lady doing something that was unsafe with her kid. I don't remember what it was. And you instructed her as to how to safely watch her children around the creek, and you did it with gusto. And, uh, I remember. And I remember going, is that Shalom? <laughs> I mean, this wasn't all that long ago. It was maybe five years ago. And uh, it was when you had kids anyway. Uh-oh. And, yeah. and uh, I... I was struck with the, the forth, forcefulness and the, uh, the, uh, your presence, your confidence. Your, your, you were out of your shell, for sure. And, and the lady who was older than you at the time, I think it was somebody that was visiting the church, was, <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes, shalom. Uh, how did you go from that timid? Do you think that the training that they gave you fostered that in you? Absolutely. Um, they, a sense of confidence and um, secure in the fact that I knew that the most important thing is to protect children. And so if, if my own ch- life with my own children, um, I have that mother nature. <laughs> I had it with Shauna growing up. I was <laughs> always called, stop being a mom. Because... <laughs> I was always trying to keep her out of harm's way and protect her and direct her to go in, you know, the right direction. Three moms. And- <laughs> yeah, she did. Um, I, I think one of the things from my perspective is that you were protected by them from us. Um, not, not that we were mean to you, but we, were, we knew we, we were more careful with Shalom than we were with Shauna. Or than, than Gabe was with me, because you needed, and the, the rule in our house, the fact that we obeyed the rules, uh, I think it protected you and allowed you to blossom into the, hmm. into the girl that teaches the women's Bible study, yeah. into, into the, uh, the, the woman you are today. Hmm. Shauna, you were not the timid spirit. <laughs> you were the center of whatever room you were in, no matter where you were standing in it. You, Still you am. are extrovert, outgoing. How, I mean, you, you guys are close in age. You lived in the same bedroom. How was it different? How did the training that, that they gave, how did it affect you? Well, I think what's great about the way mom and dad trained is there's five of us kids and they trained us all differently. They trained us to be who we are and not be all the same. I mean, every one of us, when we were born, we broke the mold. We're all totally different. And mom and dad always encouraged that. So where they were more timid with her, I think they were more aggressive in giving me the opportunities that I needed to have so that I was content and happy to be in a productive way. I think my personality, I'm such a wild child that if, <laughs> if a parent didn't handle and train the way my parents trained me, then I might be, I don't know, really bad <laughs> just because I'm all in. I am all in or I am all out. I am all the way. And so they gave me purpose by giving me structure, by giving me direction, by correcting me when I was wrong, and then giving me the opportunity to be who I am and who I want to be, you know? All right, Dad, uh, one of the things that that Anderson Cooper, uh, especially, I noticed with him, 
liked to do was to change the word spanking to hitting. And we've all talked about spanking. What's the difference between spanking and hitting? First of all, whoever controls the definitions, the language controls the argument, and that's the approach of all the media, is they use words that have inherent meaning that are offensive when they want to communicate that. So they say, hit a child. And uh, I can discuss what was actually on the air and what was seen. And so Anderson Cooper kept saying hit, and I said to him, I said, why do you use the word hit? I teach not to hit children. He said, well, hitting, spanking, whatever you call it. I said, uh, spanking is what we call it. We don't call it hitting. And he said, well, to me it's hitting. I said, well, uh, you are using inflammatory rhetoric designed to obscure the truth that I'm attempting to convey. Uh, I said, if, uh, the, he said, the words mean the same. They're synonyms. I said, if they're the same, why do you keep changing it? Why, why are you unwilling to speak the language that I speak and represent me as uh, in what I actually said instead of what you wish I said? Uh, so he would take the, uh, the thumping or the little spanking that Shoshana uh, Shalom got on the stair. Just, you know, it wasn't like turning them over and giving them a, a, a wearing out whipping. It's like uh, hitting her on the back of her calf as she starts up the stairway with a little switch about that long, uh, smaller than a pencil, something that got off a willow tree uh, that just stings the back of her leg and gets her attention, causes her to turn around. I don't think she ever even cried when we spanked her like that. And so he would call that hitting a child. Uh, but I never used my hand to hit a child. My hand is for loving the children. I've got 19 grandkids. I love the grandkids 20. with these. 20, 20, that's right. Yeah, she told me that one two weeks ago. Yeah, I had got that one counted yet. Uh, I, haven't hold, I haven't held that baby yet. Yeah. It's down. They're too little for me to hold. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's... Uh, it's something that they like to do. They like to change the words and use uh, words that uh, are going to incite the public. But remember, the, the law has never accused us of anything. No court's ever accused us of anything. Uh, we've been exonerated by the Child Protection Services in the state of Tennessee. Uh, after doing a thorough search of us, a letter of exoneration said there's no problem anything you've written, no, nothing anything you've said. Uh, but uh, it's, it's the entertainment media. They, uh, they like to be, they like to be uh, what would you say it, uh, campaigners. They like to have a, uh, a crusade. They like to be represented as saving the world. And so how do they save the world? Getting rid of the Bible, uh, getting rid of conservative Christians, get ready, getting rid of homeschooling, getting rid of traditional child training, uh, and so they're, they're coming after us, part of their entertainment program. From uh, my point of view, if somebody came up and said, did your dad ever hit you? I would laugh. <laughs> <laughs> no, my dad never hit me. I mean, uh, no. And, but you sure enough spanked me a few times. Uh, yeah, you got it a lot. You're a liar. Yeah, you know, <laughs> was. <laughs> it was. was. You, I Not said are. you were oh, a okay. liar. You were. That hillbilly, I didn't understand you. <laughs> uh, the, uh, but, but there's an obvious difference. There's a definitely an obvious difference between, and, and uh, we all know that there's a difference. Um, okay, Mom, the last thing is, I, I think it's easy for the media to, and not just the media, for, for social networking people, to, to take Dad and to make a figurehead, a, uh, something to attack, a two-dimensional thing, and he's not their dad. And he's not their husband. He is the, the guy that, that spanks children. Um, I have read stuff on a few things when all this first started. And then I quit reading. I don't want to read it. That where, where people would say awful things about dad. And they would, say, they would say, oh, well, his children are just abused and beat down. And, and they are, they are uh, all uh, sitting under a table somewhere moaning and rocking, you know. And, and it, that's, that was my reaction. I was like... I, have, these people are, you know, they, obviously they've never met us, but, uh, you know, it's such a different view of our family than all of us sitting around the table with Rebecca there, too, throwing quips back and forth and, and insulting each other and laughing uproariously about it. And uh, how, how, does it, how does it feel? I mean, 
talk to the mamas out there how that we're going to get attacked as Christians. How do you stand up under it? Well, um, I went through it before with a homeschooling issue. And when I went through it with a homeschooling issue back in the late 70s and early 80s, it scared me because I was the only one I knew that was homeschooling. But it was the same media problem, and it was still making us out to be crazy and, um, and just people that were strange to do this strange thing, standing against uh, the government or whatever. But I saw that the homeschooling movement blossomed and what came out of it was good. So when this came along, it was just almost like the very same pattern. It was just a slightly different turn, and it was the turn on child training. Even the word training doesn't imply spanking. It implies teaching someone mm -hmm. how to go from this point to this point. And so that is what we, our basic, our basic teaching is, is to train. And that's what homeschooling was, to train. And so um, I figured that Christians everywhere would go, well, they jumped in for homeschooling. They're going to jump in and say, the media is just lying. And so we're going to do the right thing, and we're going to enjoy the training that we're, we've been taught and pass it on to other people. You know, one of the things that uh, the media throw at me and then wouldn't give me a chance to answer it, an accusation that I believe that training children was like training a mule because I gave an example in, to train up a child about how we trained mules to drag logs and plow in the garden and so forth. And uh, I said that the principles of child training are the same ones that the Amish used to train their stubborn mules. And so they took offense to that. And I can understand that because some of their children are not as smart as mules. <laughs> and it would be an insulting and they're a whole lot more stubborn than mules. Uh, but the... The, the first principle in training animals is to establish a relationship of trust. I have a, I have a whole, I've actually written a book, which is not published yet, I'm still working on it, on uh, the principles of child training. And spanking is like night. There's eight steps before you ever spank a child. And the first one is, with an animal, you establish a relationship of trust. The animal has to know that you're not going to hurt him. And uh, you have to know the animal's not going to hurt you. For instance, if you're training a horse, he might hurt you. He may want to because he's afraid. And uh, so you have to establish yourself, number two, as an authority. And uh, you do that without hurting the animal or causing him to fear. And so uh, that's uh, child training and uh, animal training is so close. In fact, the, uh, I saw a survey where uh, people who train their animals are several hundred percent more satisfied with their animals than people who don't train them. So many people are not training their children. They're allowing the social media to train them. They're allowing the public school to train them. And the children are running wild. We begin training them very young, establishing relationship of trust, uh, communicating our will, uh, creating an uh, environment where they can do that will, uh, having guiding parameters, uh, using constraint, uh, not tying them up, but using constraining uh, environment to, to get them to do the, our will. And then uh, uh, admonition, encouragement, uh, drilling, practice, all these things you do with an animal to train him to go outside instead of inside on the carpet. And uh, we train our children with much of the same principles. You just go by and get the book, Idiot's Guide to Child Training, and tr change the word dog to child, and you got a good child training book, basically. Um, I, have, I have worked with fantastic horse trainers that have very obedient horses, and uh, they discipline their horses. But I guarantee you, if you wouldn't ask them if they hit your horses, they'd hit you because they, they're gentle with their horses, in, in, and even when they discipline them. And they'll use a, a quirt and make them run in a circle. Yeah. But... It, it, of course, they're not the same totally as kids, but they, uh, they, they definitely see the difference between hitting an animal and... One of the things thrown at me on air was, it was as this thing was shutting down, was 
but animals don't spank their young. Well, <laughs> she never lived on a farm. It was a child. It was a child psychologist that said that, and she said it with such confidence, and everybody cheered on set. Uh, if you will read, the mama koala actually takes her baby, turns him over her lap, and bangs him on the <laughs> rear end until he screams bloody murder if he gets out of order. Now, why does she do that? Because in uh, an animal community the babies are in danger of being killed yeah. by aggressive males and aggressive females. And a mother has to teach her young to live within the rules of the community or the young dies. Mm -hmm. If you've ever raised chickens, you know that, puppies, cats, pigs, cows, horses, everybody on a farm knows that all parents of all animals always train their young and they use constraining force. And the, the main principle is the parent always wins. The child is never allowed to win. The parent does that out of love. It's an instinct to preserve the life of that uh, sibling. And so wolves do it, whales do it, uh, monkeys, uh, every animal on the face of the earth, the parent trains the young except snakes. And we kill snakes. Well, uh, growing up on the farm, most of the animals trained by nipping are, are biting. Yeah. I'm glad you used a switch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You tasted too bad to bite you. <laughs> you. And as to the koalas, the reason they do that is because they haven't read your book. They don't know they're using a switch. I know. Yeah. If the koalas could read, they would learn to do that in a, With a way switch. that yeah. they could learn to train so they wouldn't have to spank. That's right. Okay. I, uh, that's the, 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 the point to this is that we want to, uh, encourage people. We had to address the media stuff, but we want to encourage you that, that you, can, uh, you can raise kids that, that love you, that love each other, that love the Lord, and are happy and productive. And if you stick to the Word of God, and you, and you stick to the, the principles of, of training found in the Word of God, then you will uh, be blessed. You will be glad when your children are grown. We will never answer the media the, 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 the far left to their satisfaction. They will never go, oh, okay, so you guys are happy? Your kids are happy? Oh, okay, then I guess they did all right. Uh, and we're not going to try. We're, we're not going to try to convince them. They, we will never convince them that, that this is the greatest country in the world. We'll never convince them that God made them and loves them and died for them. And we'll never convince them that we have the best parents in the world. And, and we're not going to try. Because uh, it, I'm going to try. It, <laughs> I'm not going to try. It'd be a waste of time. Okay, so let's move on from that and let's go to uh, the, growing up. Let's 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 go through some of the things that we did and and uh, our lives growing up. Okay, uh, Dad, briefly, you did something radically different than those around you. It was different than than uh, your your siblings, her siblings. Uh, and it, it was a throwback probably to, a, to an earlier time, the way that you raised us. What gave you the confidence? What gave you the idea? Did you have somebody that you said, this is the way they've done it and I want to? How'd you start? I, I'm not quite sure what this thing is I did that was a throwback. I, <laughs> you're not talking about the time I had Shoshana eat a corn worm, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about... I'm civilized now. The, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about the difference between, between the, the household that I grew up in and the other kids that around me that didn't, that didn't have the kind of peace or that didn't have the kind of spankings that, that uh, when I say didn't have the kind, they didn't have the relationship that we had. I saw kids that got hit. Uh, what was it? Was it that... that uh, okay. Okay, go ahead. It was traditional child training that uh, you take to be... Uh, radical or different and uh, both Deb and I were raised in families that uh, much like ours. Uh, so I really had not read any books on child training. I didn't sit down and formulate a plan. Uh, how should I do this? Uh, like any young parent, I just sort of did what came natural, you know. Uh, but my my daddy spanked me when I needed it, and uh, I remember two or three really hard spankings. 
Uh, but what I do remember of, of my daddy a whole lot is riding in the pickup truck with him and him talking and telling me things. I remember walking through fields and him pointing out grasses or animals and explaining things. I remember him bringing home wood and paint and nails and giving me the opportunity to build something. I remember him reading the Bible. I remember sitting down with Bible stories and reading. I remember uh, a thousand things that he did because he was building into my life. And so that's what I did with my children. I, uh, they were my most important possession. They were my most, uh, the center of my life, the center of my goal, the object of living was to communicate my culture, my love, my peace, uh, communicate wisdom, uh, and uh, just to let them have fun. In other words, I think kids ought to have fun, and I was always fun-making yep. for my kids. Uh, you guys would be out riding a bicycle, and uh, you would be uh, jumping over something, and I would go get a concrete block and a 4 by 4 sheet of plywood and show you how to make a jump where you could really get airborne. And, and if you remember, I would stand there and laugh for 15 or 20 minutes watching you crash and get up and try it until you did it right. Uh, I'd see you on the pond swinging on a grapevine and uh, we would climb a tall tree and take a half a day and put a big rope up and build a platform so you could swing and then we'd show you how to uh, do uh, flips and dives. And so, I mean, that's what we did. Our life was, your life was built around uh, learning, expanding the opportunity, learning skills, doing things. And so uh, I, in my book, I talk about tying strings of fellowship. And so we, I tied those strings of fellowship with you guys, knowing that if you were enjoying life at home, you wouldn't become rebellious. If you respected uh, me because I was a source of uh, goodness in your life, then you wouldn't want to, to rebel against my teaching. And so our home was a place of delight and fun and creativity and excitement and uh, we wanted our house, our home, to be the most exciting place. We didn't want you to go somewhere and say, hey, I'd like to be there, or see a group and say, I think they're more fun. We, we wanted to remain the most exciting, fun, thrilling, uh, stable thing that uh, life could offer. And so I, I think we pretty well maintained that. Yeah. It was, wasn't it? Yes. yes. Yeah. We, and, and uh, the thing that you, you mentioned that, that struck me was that we were the center of your life, and we knew it. We, we always knew that it was all about us and, and never wondered. Um, Shalom, your experience from early on, um, the, uh, the, the, the differences between the way that, that you were raised and maybe the way that the neighbors or somebody down the road did you did you feel different? Did you feel cloistered, like you were like you were hidden and couldn't do things? Did you feel like you were stopped from from being who you wanted to be? <laughs> Absolutely not. I think we, I, all of us uh, felt more um, privileged. Um, we had a lot more confidence. If we were all with a bunch of our friends going swimming, um, we were. She was swinging off the rope the highest and you were doing the most flips, and I was on the sideline trying to protect all the kids and make sure everyone was not getting hurt and begging y'all not to do a flip. It's the water deep That's enough. our childhood in a nutshell. <laughs> true. And we were the leaders of the group. Um, if we were playing volleyball, Gabriel was in charge. If we were going bowling, uh, you planned it. Um, if we, there was a birthday party, we planned it. We did the decorating. Um, I, we always were the in the middle of it, um, doing something. So absolutely not. We never felt oystered. <laughs> um, we had between us siblings. We were not just not just close. Uh, we were friends. we were friends. We were buddies. Remember when uh, we went to Guatemala for you were teaching? I think you were preaching at an orphanage. Yeah. I was about. 18 or 19, and Shauna was, how old were you? you were, I don't know, you were younger, 14 maybe? 13? 15? I was 18, 12, she was 16, and you were 20. 20. Mm -hmm. Little mama knows. Yeah. 
Uh, <laughs> and so we we took a bus from Guatemala City to uh, Belize, but I'm and worried. you worried for us. <laughs> we had a great time. Mm -hmm. We went out, and it never occurred to me to not want to go with my sisters. I mean, we had a good time, and we. And I, I remember getting a machete and walking with you guys to the bathroom and back to take care of you and protect you. And, and I remember uh, just having fun. Um, another time I went to uh, Israel with Gabriel and Rebecca and we traveled all around and we didn't think anything of it. We were, we were buddies and we traveled everywhere together. And we met a brother and sister from Denmark. And we were like, wow, a brother and sister traveling together. That's so cool. <laughs> Wait a second, we've been doing that for months. Why does nobody else do this? You know, there was, there was nobody else. How, how did you foster that in us? What, what was it that, that it, what, did it just happen with a fun household? Or? Well, I never thought in terms of making brothers and sisters like each other. Uh, I think that basically we communicate the example to our children. And so I liked you, I liked my wife, she liked me, we all liked each other, and there was not this tension in the home. There was not this competition. There was not uh, a sense uh, that you, you felt maybe that they had a sense of entitlement that you didn't have. There was fairness and justice. And, uh, well, if you, you have a brat or a brother or sister when they're six and you have to submit to them, you're not going to like them when they're 10. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, that's so right. they now, never were allowed to be brats to I you. I think also that you guys put the pecking order in motion, and I think that was huge because I was, I was the youngest, and you guys didn't have to take me when you guys were going to do something fun all the time. <laughs> and so I think it made you guys like me better. I know Gabe, he was traveling, going and playing volleyball and stuff, and they never told him to take me. But because he had the option – and I would, you know, do anything for him, then he, he took me. But I think that makes me work to love him. Like, I wanted him to, I mean, I thought he was incredible, but I wanted him to think I was the coolest thing in the world. And I think that it made him like me more because of that relationship, allowing the pecking order, allowing the older siblings to train the younger ones, not, allow, not making the older ones um, not making, forcing them or making them feel like they're obligated. One of the things that uh, I appreciated about our, our spanking system in the house, and I, to this day, am very glad, is I, when I see other people, their kids don't know when they're going to get spanked. There's an aggravation level that builds. And, and then when their parents get enough aggravation, why are you doing that? Why, 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 why? That never happened to me. There were rules. Yeah. If you lied, and I know this rule really well, if you <laughs> lied, you get 10 licks. If, if you uh, hurt one of the small girls, you get 10 licks. If you were, you get five licks. And I remember um, when we were, if we were disobedient, we got five licks. And I remember you counseling people on the couch. And we, Gabriel and I would come in and rattle around and you'd go, We'd, we'd leave. And if we didn't, you'd, we'd look over and, oh, man, that's five licks. <laughs> we didn't obey. I mean, we knew what was coming. And you didn't get irritated and yell, and there wasn't. But because of that, there was never a tension in our house. There was never this, this overshadowing that, that uh, okay, Sean is aggravating mom, so we're going to, if she's getting aggravated, she's probably going to whip me later on, you know. Okay. <laughs> but I see kids, I see families like that now. Yeah. And, and uh, did you guys notice that at all? Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it, Definitely. I mean, I think that I see that every day, and it's sad and scary. And James and I talk about it with raising our kids, seeing other families come over there and it goes one two three it's kind of waiting for that timer when are they going to break and finally spank and then spanking's a bad idea because they're aggravated and the kids emotionally upset and it's not it's not an appropriate time so i think that absolutely a lot of people do it wrong um and mom and dad did it right <laughs> what it is we all have an aversion to displeasing our children and spanking them and obviously displeasing them. We all want peace. 
And so I'm sitting here in my chair, and the kids are fighting, okay? So I say, stop fighting. And they keep on carrying on. And so I say, I'm not going to tell you again. So we only tell them four or five more times. And each time we get louder or more angry. And uh, what's happening is this tolerance curve is building, as you say. And the parent reaches a point to where he's so frustrated that the spanking is a vent of his own feelings of, of resentment, hostility, and anger. And the child senses that. The child senses that he's not, he's not, this is not a dignified thing that's happening. This is not something for his good. This is something to satisfy the anger of the parent. It's kind of like a brawl, and the daddy's going to win because he's going to, He's bigger, he can do it, but he won't win when, he's six, when the kid's 16 years old. The kid will turn on him. So there's no place for anger. There's no place for intolerance. It's where when we spanked a child, they knew what the offense was. They knew they had it coming. It was quiet and reserved. It was dignified. It had the, it had the dignity of a court setting where they were found guilty. A sentence was passed and they were spanked. Now, how often did that happen? Every day? Maybe uh, every day for a two and a half, three year old for something little, for some of them. Uh, but uh, by the time they're four, they're pretty well trained, you know? Uh, one of the kids, I forget which one is, said, she, one of the girls said she couldn't remember being Robert spanked. <laughs> she, yeah, she didn't give her so spanked. She, can, she can't ever remember being spanked. Uh, but Seven all I had to do months. was Shalom. <laughs> all, I had to do, all I had to do with Shalom was just point at her like that. And, uh, and she, she would straighten up, you know. Now, Shoshana, you point at her, she'd point back <laughs> like that. So pointing didn't do her any good. Well, most people, uh, they don't train their children. They get angry at them for something like spilling milk. I mean, he spills milk, I don't you know, and milk. I never spank him for it. Tea, I spill. <laughs> oh, excuse me, uh, but it's Unsweet not tea. not like they're trying to train him for something. It's just like they're mad at him, and so that kind of household doesn't make for happy children. It makes for tension. So, you know, that's something that's that's neat is that uh, it goes with you saying that we were the center. Stuff was never more important than us. If we if we mess something up, it was never more important than us. And I, I I like that, and I have that in in, in our house. I I uh, said early on, Zephyr and I were my wife and I were talking about uh, the kids and the way we wanted to raise them. This was before we had kids, and what we were going to do about the house and things like that. And I said, you know, if if our kids, because we were at somebody else's house and they yelled at their kids for getting their feet on the floor, I said if if our kids ever have to get yelled at because they messed up the carpet I said I'm gonna take the carpet and throw it in the front yard and we're gonna walk on plywood and of course Carpet's I've never been able to the, <laughs> the carpet stay in the front yard and I've never actually built bought carpet I we still walk on plywood no we have carpet in two rooms and hardwood in the rest um, so uh, I, but I like that I like that we had that we had st us were more important than stuff the house was made kid friendly yeah. our, our home was a place for kids to play, paint, and do whatever they did. And you know, you guys never wrote on the walls, you know, except one wall that we had you could write on. <laughs> there. And so uh, we, uh, we trained you and gave you opportunity to express your need for art or your need for running or tumbling. We had a chair you could tumble on, a bed you could jump on. There were off limits, but there were, uh, those off limits didn't, constrain you to keep you from being a kid. There was always a context there for you to be a kid and to explode without causing damage to the home. Well, not much damage to the home. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shauna, uh, you were daddy's toothless little buddy. Um, Still am. You, you, <laughs> you have, have teeth. teeth now, yeah. Um, she you, takes them out at night. Yeah. <laughs> Only every other night. <laughs> Just uh, because you do doesn't mean I do. <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 but, but you, I remember, you know, you were the youngest, and you rode around in the pickup truck with Daddy with a big toothless grin, and you were at the rope swing with Daddy all the time. And, and some of that was because 
the, the older ones, we were out baling hay or goofing off, having a good time. And, and so you were daddy's buddy. How does that affect your relationship with your husband, your life in general? Do, do, you, do you feel like that your relationship with your dad has an impact today on, on who you are and how does it? Oh, absolutely. I think that the way a kid, a girl, grows up treating her dad, it makes a big difference the way she treats her husband. I mean, I mean, I learned from mom and dad's relationship on um, husband and wife relationship. I mean, I remember when I was 13 and I was at someone's house and they were fighting. I was babysitting. They came home and they started fighting. Not, not us. The mom, no, no, the mom and dad were fighting. <laughs> and I well, remember right, right <laughs> being blown away. I mean... I remember going home. Do you remember this? I remember. I came home and I was horrified that parents fault. I had never heard of that before. And I think... Grown-ups had a fight. (laughs) And I told mom, like, this was groundbreaking news the first time that has ever happened. And she looked at me and she goes, yeah, parents do that sometime. And I couldn't believe that her reaction was like, yeah, it happens sometime. Like, people do that in this world. But I think that that made a difference. But I think it also, I mean... I always wanted to make my dad smile, make his eyes twinkle. And I catch myself doing the same thing to James. I mean, I still, I, we've been married eight years and I still do things to make his eyes twinkle and flirt with him. And I, it's amazing to me um, the fun relationship that a husband and wife can have and the impact raising your kids right i mean i'm so careful when i look at my little girl penelope and jeremiah i'm constantly thinking about that that is a grown-up right there that's a mother that's a father everything that i do is going to impact them the way my mom and dad impacted me i view all the children in the church which is four out of five people in the church are children (laughs) i view every one of them as as adults little incomplete adults uh, I know that that three-year-old, if I, Lord gives me life, I will see that three-year-old grow up to be uh, 18, 19 years old. And how are they going to view me when they're 18 years old? Is that, is that little boy going to say, uh, he's cranky, he's a crab, uh, I, don't want any, I don't want his God? Or is he going to turn 18 and say, that's the one I want to, to marry me when I get married? That's the one that I'm going to go to for advice. That's the one I want counsel because he cared about me when I was small. He took me for a ride in his buggy. He went swimming with me. He uh, gave me a pat on the head. He uh, talked to me. He asked me what I was doing. He looked at my frog. He looked at my picture. He put, it, he put my picture on his wall. And so I, I treat all children like that, knowing that, that they are adults in the making. And what I do in their life right now is going to determine what they are when they're grown. You can't wait until they're 18 and then all of a sudden say, okay, now I'm going to relate to you differently. Uh, You start relating to them as human beings who have some value and some worth uh, from the day they come out of the womb. Um, I know with with my kids that I I see who they are at three, and now my oldest is nine, and she's the same little girl, but she's just, the issues are bigger, the things are bigger, and she's... And, and uh, it's, it's so important to me to keep her heart, to keep her, to keep her, uh, just to talk to her. And, and I think I valued that as a kid to, to sit around and talk or to, uh, I remember uh, hanging out in the shop, taking all the scraps from the cabinets and like two gallons of your glue and building a castle. And I was, I was working with daddy. I mean, I was what, four or five years old there in Watkins in the shop. But I was working with Daddy, and it was, it was a sense of camaraderie. It was, a, it was, and it. To this day, I love building things. That's what I do for a living. And we're, yesterday, I was out as a hundred degrees, and the guys working with sweating and carrying on. We're building the deck, and he's like, "Man, it's hot." I'm like, you know, I love it. I just love being out here building this. I just, I'm having a good time. He said, "You're crazy." I, said, well, I don't care. I like doing what I do. I like building things, and I, I tie it back to that. I got a note that says uh, I'm almost out of time, but since we're not done talking, we're going to just keep going a little longer. So uh, uh, stick with us, and, and we'll keep going until we feel like we're done. <gasps> we, we can do that. It's our show. <laughs> 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 
We can do it because it's our show and our producer said it was okay. Um, okay, um, Shalom, I asked Shauna how her relationship with dad affected her marriage. You had a different relationship with dad than Shoshana did because you're a different person than Shoshana. How did, how did it affect you, that, that, that different relationship? How, how do you feel like it, it affected you today? Um, he protected me when he would, he'd say, go move the truck. He was talking to Shauna. <laughs> if he said, go lo- mow the lawn, he was talking to Shauna. And I knew that I didn't have to do those things. If he said, somebody wash the dishes, I knew that that was my job and, or go take care of the kids or, and so, um, as far as how it, it built confidence in me, um, and a sense of security knowing that he was protecting me and that he was watching out for my best interest and that he knew my heart and he knew that he was not pushing me beyond my abilities um now that i've gotten married my husband has pushed me and taught me how to drive a tractor and (laughs) a standard stick shift but uh but my dad saved that for him to teach me. <laughs> I wanted him to have some input. <laughs> He's like, you don't know how to drive a tractor? <laughs> it's like, my dad didn't make me do that. That was Shauna's job. Uh, so I... Um, but you, ma- you make it sound as though Gabe and I did nothing around oh, the house. Like, like we're, we're sitting in a lawn chair watching our little sister drive the tractor. You were out doing construction work. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. That's so manly. So you were learning to do construction work. <laughs> you can have the tractor. on roofs. <laughs> But um, I think he did not push, uh, I wasn't pushed past my abilities, but the things that he, I did built a sense of um, confidence in me and security that I could do it. I could accomplish it. Um, and I could do a good job at it. And so um, today I have that confidence that I know how to homeschool my kids. I know how to clean my house. I know how to minister to the young girls. And I know that um, through mom's wisdom that she taught me that I can counsel people. And I have that confidence. Shalom was the steady, dependable, reliable, trustworthy servant. And she found joy and pleasure in serving. She didn't find pleasure in getting out front and being the center of attention. She found pleasure and meaning in being in the background serving. And so Shoshana just was very uncomfortable and very unhappy in the background serving. She had to be out front, as you say, the center of of the room. uh, the room. But what Shoshana was doing also is she was putting in other people's lives. In other words, she wasn't just seeking uh, to be in the front, but she was using that as an opportunity to steer people into things that they enjoyed, into, into pleasure. And uh, from the very young, Shoshana was out there witnessing, sharing the gospel. Mm-hmm. She led people to the Lord when she was a small child because she was bold and confident, uh, whereas uh, Shalom would be more fearful to to go out and share the gospel like Shoshana. But Shoshana could have been a street preacher at nine years old. <laughs> I think actually you did a little bit of it, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, and so kids are different and you, you and Gabe were different. Yeah. See, Gabe came along first and he was uh, outdoorsy and uh, loved to kill things and skin them out and hang the skins up. And uh, I think the fir- when he was about 12 or something, he, the first, the opening season of squirrel season, he killed 56 squirrels in five days, and I, and I made him skin every single one of them out and, and uh, bring the meat in the house. He never wanted to kill a squirrel after that, 56 <laughs> squirrels in one week. But now you, you didn't care about killing anything. Uh, they go deer hunting when you were grown, and you would do the cooking. You remember that? You were, oh, coo- you were cooking in Colorado. I was 18. 18 years old. <laughs> and uh, you were cooking, and they were out bow hunting, a long bow for elk. And uh, you saw elk step into view in the camp. Well, no, it wasn't in camp. We were, we were in Colorado hunting, and uh, Gabe, my brother, was out every day, and he's a good shot with a bow. And he's got all this really good gear. And he had two bows. He had a long bow and a compound bow. Well, I started out going to uh, camp, and I would uh, 
I would, they, while they'd go hunting, I'd get up and make them breakfast before light, and him and Bob, they'd go hunting, and then I would go back to bed and sleep till 8, 30, 9 o'clock. That's him. Then, well, no, I, I mean, I got up before them and made breakfast, and then I, because I like cooking over a campfire, I'd go back to bed, I then I'd get up, and I'd hike to the truck all the way down the hill, get food and things for the next day, hike back up, and then we'd go around. Well, I then, t- Gabe, after two weeks in the season, decided the, co- the, long- the longbow wasn't effective enough, so he switched to a, his deadly uh, compound bow. And I took his longbow and his arrow and his pack, his camouflage breeches, and uh, went hiking. And I was hiking, and I shot this big bull. He still hasn't got one like that with a bow. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, you know, everybody gets nervous and anxious, but I just, I really, I'd take a book, and I'd sit down and read, and I just had the bow to dink at squirrels or whatever just for entertainment. And uh, I shot that. I laughed so hard all the way back to camp. <laughs> it burns him to this day. But... I gave him the antlers they hang in his, his house. I don't, I don't care anything about it. I call them his trophies of death that hang on the wall. So what I was saying is you guys were so different. Gabriel came along, and he was, a, he was a man's man from the time he was a little bitty. And then you come along, and you are this student, scholar, philosopher, uh, uh, pacifist, uh, if I think of a better word. Uh, and uh, manly pacifist, more <laughs> more uh, more sensitive than he was, and so I had the I had gotten used to what a boy is supposed to be like with Gabe, and then you come along, and you're not like him at all, and so I realized I was always in danger of expecting you to be like him, and that'd be a very big problem if I did that. And so I had to take extra precaution to make sure that I accepted you just like you were and encouraged your gifts and abilities in the direction you went without, uh, without causing you to feel uh, rejected. And uh, I don't know it always did that, but it seemed like it worked out pretty good. Uh, now that we're on air, you can say it did. <laughs> it worked out good. <laughs> No, I didn't. I never felt like I had to, to perform or to do something in particular. That's and, important. Well, also, Gabe and I are both uh, so confident in our own right. And, and but it was developed some way. It was yeah. developed because he saw the strength in you and brought it out. But uh, Gabe and I were, were not in uh, competition. competition to be something we were uh and i remember you telling me when i was about 13 or 14 you said uh, i want you to love the lord and besides that you can do or be what you want to be and uh i just still like building things with blocks of wood so shalom tell about nathan when he was little walking around property praying crying do you remember that no i doubt it she's younger than me yeah younger than him i wouldn't remember rebecca's one that remembers that when he was about uh Four, four years old. Wow. He would uh, go out and walk around the property crying and praying. All in his hands, crying. <laughs> Gabriel would never have done that. No. And uh, we just, we didn't make anything out of it. We didn't talk about it. Just kind of ignored him, you know. And uh, where's Nathan? We'd say, and when Rebecca would say, oh, he's out there praying, doing his prophet thing, <laughs> you know, out prophesying on the hill, like Elijah or something. So, yeah, you kids were, were terribly different. Um, moving on. Do <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> Barely. I sound so sensitive. <laughs> I have a beard and everything. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a beard. I eat spicy chili. You know, I'm a man's man. <laughs> okay. Uh, what are these notes for? Uh, you know, one thing I wanted to ask is is when we moved up here we i was about what eight years old we moved up here from watkins and uh when we moved up here we redefined poor i mean we <laughs> redefined what poor poor poor, oh. poor yeah um i think if you look at at poor today it's if you don't have more than four televisions we we were we were poor, we were poor. but we lacked for nothing and we loved life how much of that was was moving up here was for us i mean it was a terrible career move because you had a good cabinet business that we left well i had a business i was able to buy the property build the house buy all the equipment i needed off of 
the money that I'd made in art and cabinet building. So I could have stayed there and uh, kept making money, but I just got bored with the life of making money and I realized that you kids needed uh, some challenges. I was able to make sufficient money to uh, meet all of our needs there and I just thought, well, let's just be pioneers. Let's give the kids some challenges. Let's put them to work. Because I could, I could give you work, but I didn't need you to work where we lived. That was key. When we moved here, I needed you to work. We when we planted 700 tomato plants and how many squash and watermelon and cucumber and whatever and bell pepper uh, in the front 10 acres, uh, I couldn't tie up 700 tomato plants. I needed you guys. I couldn't hoe them out. I needed you guys. Whenever it came squash picking time, we picked uh, hundreds of pounds of squash a day. Uh, the girls here were the squash pickers, you know. And we'd take them down. I think we got $2.50 for a five-gallon bucket of squash. I was just telling that story to Gracie the other day because, yeah, yesterday, because we went to pick the squash. And I was like, did you know Mama used to pick squash? And she's like, can I do it? Can I do it? $3 a bucket? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, it wasn't worth it. <laughs> it, it was two fifty or two twenty five. Two twenty five. Shauna would remember the, the money. I did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Our arms were so scratched up. Every so, day. So I wanted you I wanted I wanted an environment where we could homeschool without the government getting down on us. I want an environment where we could have friends. We, we used to have to be so careful about who you associate with because there were people who wanted to come into our life that we didn't approve of. So we moved here in a context to where uh, we could have friends or community that was more uh, Christian, more rural, more farm, where people didn't have television sets and didn't go to malls and dances and dress immoral and immodest. So it was a combination of wanting to give you, uh, give you some struggles, give you some opportunities to, to learn, to grow, to be needed, and to give you a protecting environment. So. I'll tell you another thing. Uh, we let y'all work with other people. Mm -hmm. A lot of families get so tied in, they say, even to an 18-year-old boy, I don't want you going out and doing this, you might be exposed to that. But early on, Mike chose a good man so you learn a good li living. And the girls were allowed to go out and work too in and, and protected areas, but it gave everybody an opportunity to make money and to learn a trade. The uh the one thing that I think that taught, the biggest thing that it taught me, besides the trade that I do today, is uh, that the work that I did was valuable. Mm -hmm. I, I came back and I gave part of it to the girls because they stayed home and picked the vegetables because I was out working and I was like, I was making five bucks a day or something. And, uh, but the work that I did was valuable and you treated the work that I was doing as valuable. I've, I've, yeah, I took a third of it. <laughs> Yeah, it was valuable to you. You all, all the two dollars and fifty cents. Uh, but, but what I mean is, I, I have had kids come to work for me that I'm trying to take under my wing and help. And their parents don't treat their work as valuable. It's something that they're doing when they, when the parents want them to. But they'll, at some point, just yank them back. Oh, you can't work today because you were uh, did some nefarious thing yesterday. So you're not allowed to work today. And it it creates this environment where they're not sure their work's not really valuable. It's something that they can do sometime. And because of that, uh, we're all hard workers. Mm -hmm. Every one of us are hard workers. Most, uh, I think what, four of us are on our own businesses. And uh, Shalom is a uh, push Bible studies and, and uh, uh, mama and takes care of stuff around here. And so we're all involved with other people's lives are all involved with uh, uh, business with with work and I I feel like that's one of the things that fostered it was knowing that what I did was valuable to the family yeah. we were not well off but we had everything we needed what would you guys change any of that Absolutely not. I always, I tell my girls that the best part of my life was the couple years when we first moved here when we were poor. And they love those stories of when mom made me, I had a friend come over and she made me little 
biscuits <laughs> and fried them and rolled them in powdered sugar and we had two each and we were that was just wonderful and i'll always remember it or um when we'd eat you know have our make our cornbread and oh we have butter today and it was a wonderful thing to put butter on it um that we churned yeah. with the milk that we bought from the money that i made see how valuable i was that butter was good i yeah. think also that it did teach us to work but i think that um like with my kids i mean my husband and i work and we do well and our kids work with us i think mom and dad taught us to work but didn't teach us that unless we were poor we weren't going to raise good kids that in any situation a parent can get their kids involved to have them a part of their lives what what james and i do is that in everything they're working, our office workers, actually a girl came to me last week and she said, you know, I noticed, I mean, you're doing things all the time, but nothing's more important to your kids than your kids. You stop no matter what you're doing to have your kids a part of it. And that, I think that's, that's where it's at. I mean, Jeremiah and Penelope, I can tell you, they're the best kids in the world. And I've seen a lot of kids. I mean, they're great kids. But- Hers are good too. The hers are too. Hers are good too. <laughs> But I mean, mine are better <laughs> and cuter, <laughs> not, not a chance, but I think that you can raise a kid in any an environment, but your mindset has to be your kids are first and that with everything you are teaching them to be an adult, to make wise decisions, to, um, that they, their work is valuable, that they are needed in the world, that they do make a difference. I mean, for Jeremiah, I talked to him, I say, you know, what you do makes a difference. What you do with your friends, what you teach your friends, the way you talk to you, everything is gonna make a difference. And it's funny, I mean, today we're at the dentist office and boy, he told all of them the way it was. I mean, it, it, they were coming in just to see him because he was so, he's a comedian, but he was educating them. And they were all adults standing around listening to him as he voiced his opinion. But. I think it's awesome to be able to raise kids in this traditional child training way um, in any environment. But I mean, it was, I think it's easier, kind of like dad said, he had to develop things to challenge us in the city where um, it's easier in the country. The, uh, the thing is when we moved up here and we were, we were broke, it wasn't because uh, dad was ever sitting at home and i i appreciate that uh example yeah. and uh the uh dad never if he wasn't employed was never not working we had the sawmill we were cutting stuff we were building a house and rebuilding a business and then when you started again we were cutting hickory sticks and that was probably the most fun in the world that a 12 year old could have because we were we were all working together we were all getting paid a piece of each stick. I think I made five cents per hickory stick, and you made the other dollar ninety-five. But, but we were getting, we were getting, a, and we were all working together. And once again, there was that sense of camaraderie, that sense of we're doing this together, we're doing this for the family, and we're all making a little bit off of it. And uh, it didn't take long. It took a couple of years to start rebuilding wealth, rebuilding. When I say wealth, I mean we actually had a car. Well, I ran. think pleasure in life is in climbing a mountain it's in overcoming it's in achieving and if people are filthy rich and the kids miss the opportunity of achieving of overcoming of of climbing the ladder of life then they miss something very valuable so that's what i wanted for you guys i could have left you at home and gone out and made lots of money but i didn't want to do that I always did things that you could do with me. Mm -hmm. What he's talking about cutting hickory sticks, we, uh, what, I got $2 a piece for a hickory pole, two and a half inches in diameter and 10 feet long, and they used them to make furniture. So we'd go into the deep woods and we would cut these poles. And, uh, and uh, you, Gabriel got 7%, uh, you got 5%, and Bob, a uh, friend, got uh, 3%. And then I took what's left. So. You guys end up making uh, 40 50 $60 a week, uh, something like that. 
and we got that little dune buggy, that Honda Odyssey, and yeah. I got to drive it, I would have paid to go. I uh, know. <laughs> you know that. You were, the, you were the best driver. <laughs> that was the most fun in the world, <laughs> driving a little go-kart through the woods. Well, do you remember the big uh, thing of mint tea that I made y'all that time? Oh, any reward. That will defame you as a herbalist. <laughs> she, she made us a, she made us a, uh, a pot. It was cold out. So she had a military thermos that was about two gallons, and it was supposed to be a spearmint tea. Spearmint, yeah. And you used catnip, didn't well, you? Actually, it was a peppermint. It was pennyroyal. It's a type of mint that makes you, it tightens up the muscles instead of relaxing. We had them. one roll of toilet paper in the truck, and we needed four. <laughs> they were all sick in the woods, got that was not a good experience. <laughs> that gamble was so mad. <laughs> he still talks about it. <laughs> he won't drink peppermint tea He didn't anymore. trust my herbal anything. It's been 30 years. <laughs> that was rough. It was cold and we were all running different directions from the trees. Sean is herbs you can trust. <laughs> not uh, okay, the, uh, what we want to... We want to affirm that us kids had a good time growing up. We liked these two people. We liked growing up in our house. <laughs> we, we were fun, are fun, outgoing. Uh, ha we had a good time. We were, uh, we were each independent and enjoyed each other. Not because we had to, but... Uh, because we liked each other and uh it it carries over into our lives and into our children's lives it enriches the the life that we have enriches my kids and i hope my grandkids because it 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 gave us a foundation now with the the upbringing that we had we had all these tools for for life, for marriage, for child training. We, we knew what a good relationship looked like. It, we were all a little bit shocked when we saw one that wasn't as good. Um, but just having the tools doesn't make, it, doesn't make it work. We all had to choose at some point to love yeah. God. We all have to choose to love our spouse the way that we should. And growing up in our home, I know what cherishing my wife looks like because I saw my dad cherish my mom. I know what a wife honoring her husband looks like because I saw it. I know what a, a, a well-ruled household, and I, I say ruled like God told Abraham, I choose you because you rule your own house well. I know what it looks like, but I still have to choose to cherish my wife. Mm -hmm. I still have to choose to put my kids first. And it's not just the fact I think what makes you successful as a parent is not just the fact that you do this list of things. It's that you instill in us the desire to choose to do the same. And uh, we all have. That's what we choose. And, and Shalom grew up knowing what a wife loving her husband and honoring her husband looks like. And a strong-willed Shoshana grew up knowing what reverencing her husband looks like. And she does. I see him. I, I'm, I'm around her and her family, and she reverences her husband. And I see so many people with your personality that don't appreciate their husbands because you can do it for yourself. And I see girls with your personality that, that uh, cannot talk to other people. They don't have the confidence to step up and to say, this is what's right and this is what's wrong. Mama, you're not doing what, and, and, and fuss at somebody or, or to teach somebody else or to do the, the women's Bible study. Or also be hurt. I see a lot of women with her personality take on the, I feel sorry for myself when their husband isn't awesome. And Shalom, what I see. But I have an awesome husband. But she has an awesome <laughs> husband. But what I see Just in her, up. what I see okay. in her is whether it's with her husband or with someone else, she has backbone even though she is a mild personality and that's what i think this child training did for her it gave her backbone 
and where a lot of women that are more sweet don't have. Well, um, to, to close this is what I want to do is I want, I want to encourage you that we had us kids, we had a bet. We had an easier time than you. I'm sorry, but, <laughs> but we did really, I mean, we grew up in the best home in the world and, and had a lot of advantages, but we still all choose. We all individually choose to do what's right. We choose every day. We individually chose to love God. I was not born a Christian. Right. I, I chose at some point in my life to love God and to honor God. And every day I have to choose again. Mm -hmm. and, and you have a chance at this point in your life to choose to raise your kids to love and honor the Lord. You have a chance to bring up your kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. To, to nurture them the way that we've talked about today, to nurture them and to love them and to, to woo and teach them and guide them. Husbands, you have a chance to love your wives the way the dad has loved mom, the way that I love my wife, the way that the marriages that we have. You have a chance to do that if you choose to. Yeah. History, history doesn't make the future. Your choices make the future. And your choices may have been wrong. And you may be starting from, from further back. But remember, if you're, if you're a child of God, God's not going to allow you to be tempted above that you're able to overcome. And if you are tempted, He's going to make a way to escape. God's given you the tools to have a blessed home. God's giving you the tools to raise your kids to love and honor God. And to have a home full of peace and, and have a home that your kids are glad to live in. Uh, if, there's, if there's one thing, and I think we'd all say it, that, that's the best thing in the world, it's to love to go home. It's, <laughs> it's to, because I work with people that go, you know, oh, God, go home. And w not, w I never felt that way. I was always happy at home. And and you have a chance to do that. And it won't always be easy. You have to decide that you're going to believe God. God says, husbands, love your wives. As Christ also loved the church and given himself for it. You have to choose. Husbands, be not bitter against your wives. You have to choose. And you say, well, she's not. You have to choose no matter what she does, no matter how she acts, you're going to love her and not be bitter. And wives, you have to choose to reverence your husband, no matter whether he's reverenceable or not. You have to choose to answer like Shalom did and say, I've got a fine man. And I'm not saying she doesn't. <laughs> you, have to choose, not. <laughs> you have to choose whether, she, whether you believe it or not. Now you have to choose to answer that way. You have to choose to reverence your husband. And if you, if you reverence your husband and, and believe God, you'll, you'll bear fruit. You have to choose to spend time on your kids. There's not a magic pill. There's not a do these, you talk about doing these eight things to raise kids. It's not these eight things. It's the fact that we were the number one thing that made That's the difference. True. It's not the eight thing, the spanking, that did it. It's the fact that, that I was first and she was first and she was first. And the two, they were first. And we all knew we were first. And that, that's what makes a home. And you can choose today to do it. You just have to choose to believe God, to believe what he said and to obey it. And if you do, it'll be hard at first. It'll be difficult to love your wife when she's unlovable. It'll be difficult to not be bitter against your wife when she's mean to you over and over because your wife knows that one thing to say that will just... <laughs> And you're going to want to be bitter. That's why it's in the Bible. That's why it says bitter, because it's the Word of God, and He knows what you're going to... And wives, you've got to choose to reverence your husband. And even when he's not... And, and if you choose that, someday you'll be gray-haired and wrinkly, and you'll look at your... At, and strong <laughs> and debonair. And, and, you, and you will look at that wife of your youth with love and passion, and you'll look at your kids that sit around and like you and like each other, and maybe not 20, but you'll look at your grandkids, and you'll know that I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in truth 
and it starts tonight. Thank you for joining us. I believe we are ready to wrap up. Do you have guys have anything you want to add? That's good. That's good stuff, isn't it? Good I stuff. I like that too. I like it. Uh, I appreciate you joining us. The the codes that I hope that they flashed up there uh, are available. If some of this stuff pricks your your uh, heart, if you're interested, husbands, if you want to choose to love your wife no matter what. Um, there's a book that Dad wrote recently uh, called Created, Created to Need to Help Me. Yeah, you I, got read that that. <laughs> <laughs> I did read it out loud. I have the proof. Uh, and uh, Wives' mom wrote a book uh, called Created to Need no, to, be. to Be a Help Me. And, uh, and, and there's a preparing. And we're writing now called In Search of a Help Me. So young there's guys. lots of help me. <laughs> um, you try getting them all straight. Um, and then, and then there's a book on child training, and there's books on uh, the Word of God. There's all kinds of lessons to be taught, and uh, you can't isolate your walk with God, and you can't isolate something and say, "I'm going to get this right." You can't say, "I'm going to raise my kids right, but I'm going to let my marriage go." You can't say, "I'm going to get my marriage right, but I'm not going to walk with God," because it's it's all interconnected, and you're not going to get one right. You might get it okay, but you're not going to have you're not going to have this unless you're willing to be sold out for God and to get it all right. So it starts with studying and knowing the Word of God, and, and that stuff's there too. So uh, I appreciate you guys joining us, and uh, when we get the, the energy and the topic, we'll do this again sometime. And uh, if uh, I think we're going to put up the code one more time for the, the uh, coupon to get into the, into the uh, No Greater Joy and, and get some stuff. And... Uh, We'll see you next time.